Welcome to the Dispatch Podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Isger, joined as always by Steve Hayes, Jonah Goldberg, and David French. This podcast is brought to you by The Dispatch. Visit thedispatch.com to see our full slate of newsletters and podcasts, and make sure to subscribe to this podcast so you never miss an episode. Today, we're going to talk about the debate to reopen the country, the economy, and governor overreach, federalism up close for a lot of Americans. And finally, end on China, the WHO, and how this plays politically and on the world stage. Let's dive right in. I want to start with the debate we're all having in our homes across the country and from the White House podium, and that's the open up debate, let's call it. Uh, Yesterday, the president said that he, uh, quote, I will then be authorizing each individual governor of each individual state to implement a reopening, very powerful reopening plan of their state in a time and in a manner which is most appropriate. But we have lots of polls out as well on this that say that even if the the president says that the economy should reopen, and even if states remove some of their restrictions, the American public may not be ready. Uh, 81% in a morning consult poll said uh, Americans should continue to social distance for as long as is needed to curb the spread of coronavirus, even if it means continued damage to the economy. Only 10% said that we should stop social distancing to stimulate the economy, even if it means increasing the spread of coronavirus. And when asked how quickly they would return to their normal activities once the government lifts restrictions and businesses and schools start to reopen, and this is a Gallup poll, the vast majority of Americans say they would wait and see what happens. Uh, 71% would wait and see. 10% would wait indefinitely. Uh, Only 20% said they would return to their normal activities immediately. And even if you pull demographic uh, age, all sorts of other things, it doesn't really change those numbers. The only statistically significant differences, uh, that 20% that said they would return to their normal activities rises about 10 points among Republicans. And it rises two to three points uh, among those who live in rural communities, which I want to get to eventually in this conversation. Uh, And, of course, men. (laughs) Uh, David, you've written about this some. Jonah, you have too. Uh, Let's start with David. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm really glad you started with that poll because I've been getting a sense for a while that a lot of the really angry foment uh, to reopen, reopen, reopen is mainly a Twitter phenomenon. Uh, it's mainly a lot of very angry activists on Twitter, and I'm uh, and not reflecting something that's a huge groundswell in the rest of the United States, at least not while coronavirus is the number one leading cause of death in the whole United States right now. Um, I mean, this is something that happened last week and on an average daily basis has continued to happen, and that is every time you see that daily number – of deaths from coronavirus, which is almost certainly an undercount, hitting uh, above 1,700 or so is when you're seeing coronavirus become the number one leading cause of death in the U.S., way, way above car accidents, way, way above seasonal flu or complications from seasonal flu, above heart disease, above cancer. And yes, there have been some uh, models that, for example, undercounted the the projected demand for hospital beds right now. That's absolutely the case. But at the moment, you have coronavirus as the leading cause of death in the U.S. And so, therefore, as people as this reality sinks in, and that that's twenty six thousand deaths, and that that twenty six thousand number, well, more than twenty five thousand of that has been in the last four weeks. Um, And as that number sinks in, and especially the plight of New York City sinks in, you could say go tomorrow. And unless people feel safe, they're not going to go. Now, a small, you know, some percentage may, and it may be larger in the rural areas, um, but the rural areas do not drive the American economy. The American economy, uh, as I talked about in in a pretty long piece 
last week, the American economy is driven by cities, and the city that drives the American economy more than any other city in the U.S. by far is New York City. And and New York City is just on its knees with this thing, about 10,000 deaths, according to the last projections, which they revised upward to sort of bring the counting system in line with the way they count deaths from flu. And and so there is a human behavior aspect of this that governments are not in absolute control of. They're not in absolute they are not in absolute control of the shutdown and they're not in absolute control of when it reopens. Jonah, New York has seen a flattening of its curve. And if anything, yesterday, what uh, Governor Cuomo was saying was that perhaps it is seeing a downward trend in its curve and maybe a little early to say that. Um, And there are other parts of the country that are saying, and we're not New York. Yeah, no, look, I mean, this debate um, uh, reminds me a little bit for for those of us who have uh, teenage kids. um, You had the experience of your kid being sick and wanting to go to some event, play in a you know, a basketball tournament or go to a party or whatever it is. And you have to say to them, well, let's see how you feel when we get there. And they say, but you don't understand, I have to go. And you say, well, let's hope you get better. And they say, but you don't understand, I have to go. And you have to go back and forth about this. And the reality is, is that the that there's something, as David alluded to, there's just something otherworldly about this. I have no problem with other, I mean, other states reacting to these things in, in different ways and all the rest. But at the end of the day, if you if you don't have this thing under control, if you don't have some regime for testing, which is what is the only way I am, under, as I understand it, you can truly get it under control, you risk having more hotspots. And uh, New York could still turn into a hotspot. It's not like the vast majority of New Yorkers have been exposed to the coronavirus. Um, you know, most of them haven't. And if they all started getting back on the subway without having some means of controlling this and doing contact tracing, you could be essentially right back to where we were before, at least in terms of the numbers of infections and serious cases. Maybe they're better mobilized to deal with it now so the curve could actually be higher in terms of hospital uh, capacity and all of the rest. And so it's just, I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of a bizarre conversation. You know, we've had this thing where Trump wants to sometimes claim now that he has total authority to do this and sometimes to reopen the economy. Sometimes he says, well, it's up to the governors. I'm with David. It's, it's not up to any of them. It's, 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 there's a collective action issue here in terms of what is the actual state of the, the pandemic on the ground. And it's entirely possible to open up parts of the economy that don't matter as much to the GNP or the GDP as other parts of the economy. But you just sort of have to wait and see and and play it by ear. And while I agree with David that I do think that Twitter distorts this, if you read Twitter, you would have no idea that the polling is so lopsided in favor of um, quarantines, in favor of lockdowns. Um, and uh, and split on on Donald Trump's performance. You know, it's it's uh, it, the Twitter is a, has a distortion effect, but the people who are contributing to that distortion effect are playing an outsized role elsewhere. We had my old friend Bill Bennett, who I I'm, I'm sort of brokenhearted having to criticize him again, but going around saying this is just the flu, that this is a uh, essentially he's not saying it's a hoax. He's saying that it's an exaggeration and hype and all of that. Um, it's just not the flu, right? It's just not the flu. You don't normally during flu season talk about flu hotspots around the country. Um, and uh, and what is weird about – so wh- I think one of the things that drives some of these people is that the pandemic has completely thrown into the garbage heap of history the narrative that they wanted about the roaring economy, about how Trump was high in the saddle, and uh, they want to – sort of talk our way back into that narrative regardless of the facts on the ground. 
And one of the main places where that's being done is on Twitter, but Twitter is not real life. Yeah, let me let me just pick up on that real quick. I, I think there are a couple different, I mean, oversimplifying a little bit here. I think there are a couple different groups th- that are making this case that it's time to open up. Certainly one of them is, as Jonah suggests, kind of the, the a lot of people in the Trumpy center right um, parts of Twitter. Uh, and I think they're making this argument for a couple of reasons. One, they want to support Donald Trump. They're frustrated that this economy could threaten his reelection, which, you know, f- looked pretty good to them, I think, uh, two, three months ago. Um, and, and two, many of these people are the same people who were saying from the outset that this was not really that big a deal, echoing the kinds of comments that we heard Donald Trump making. So, for them to kind of turn now and say, well, yeah, you know what, it was a really big deal and, and I got it wrong, um, feels, um, I, I guess they're, they're less inclined to do that than they are to, the, to try to insist that this thing that's causing thousands of deaths every day is not that big a deal. Um, then there's a second group, and I'm much more sympathetic to the second group. I think the second group are, are, are people, and I've spoken to, to some of these people, are, are, are folks who you know, live in you know, rural parts of the country who look around and th- they're not close to anybody. They don't interact with people on a, on a, you know, lots of people on a daily basis. And they, they look around at their life as it was two months ago and say, boy, I can live my life much the same way that I could have a couple months ago. And what's with all these crazy restrictions because people in New York City are getting sick? Why should there be restrictions in central Wisconsin or rural South Carolina? Um, And I don't think those are unreasonable questions to ask, particularly when you look at some of the overreach that we've seen from local governors, whether it's Gretchen Whitmer in, in Michigan banning, you know, garden uh, sections of big box stores or, uh, you know, cops running people down on the beach in a famous video that circulated on social media this week. There's definitely some overreaction. I think people, uh, you know, out in certainly my home state and elsewhere, look at some of that and say, this is crazy. Why are we doing all this? This is largely a New York problem. There are other hotspots. Deal with the hotspots where you have to, but otherwise leave me alone. I'm, I'm not unsympathetic to that argument, but I think it misunderstands the transmissibility of this particular virus and what we've seen in some places. You remember there was the, the funeral in Columbia County, Georgia, that uh, led to a mini outbreak in that area, including some deaths. You have South Dakota, which had the, among the least restrictive um, rules in place for a while that is now really heating up despite its uh, lack of population density. So the fact is this can spread pretty readily, uh, I think much more quickly than people uh, imagine. And that's the reason that what Jonah and David have said, I think is, is right. It's not just a matter of uh, flipping, flipping the proverbial switch, as everybody says, or the president saying go. Um, you'll have some people in rural areas that are ready to get back to the, the lives that they knew three months ago. Um, but that's not going to have a dramatic effect on the economy, and certainly not when you have huge majorities of the population saying, I'm not ready to do this. So... Uh, on the rural point, what's interesting to me is that it seems that the what the data tells us is if you live in a rural part of the country, you are less likely to be exposed to the virus. However, if you are exposed to it, you are far more likely to have very negative consequences from it because rural residents tend to be older, less affluent, uh, less healthy than the national average, fewer have health insurance, longer distance to hospitals and labs. Uh, that can have catastrophic results because this can turn very quickly, as we've seen in some of these urban areas, and that uh, rural grocery stores, pharmacies, hospitals are actually last in line for some of the supplies that the chains and big box stores in more urban areas uh, sort of get first in line for. And so it's, it's an odd predicament. If you don't know anyone around you who has this, that's a good thing. But to your point, as soon as there's one, it can actually spread very quickly because as others have pointed out, uh, this idea that rural folks, I grew up in a pretty rural part of Texas, uh, 
yeah, your your social distancing may be a lot more because of population density, but when you do get together, <laughs> it's the whole town. <laughs> uh, and it's, you know, it's a uh, Friday night football game, it's the school play, it's whatever else. Um, and that being said, we've also seen now some indications, people saying that we'll have to continue this through 2022, certainly through the fall. Colleges are planning to do online learning for the fall. It's one thing to say this in April of 2020, but David, <laughs> what happens in November, December, what happens in April of 2021? Yeah, I mean, I, you raise a really good point. Uh, I, You know, a couple of things I think um, are going to have to happen to us. You know, one is, you know, we've pointed to some of these really vibrant democracies in and vibrant economies in Southeast Asia that have done a lot better uh, than virtually anybody else, even though they have an enormous uh, amount of trade with China, they have close proximity to China. Um, but they had something that we didn't have, which is that, you know, real, as we say in the South, come to Jesus moment with SARS. And so they had, and and so they, they when they began to realize that there was a potential pandemic brewing in China, there was this both governmental and very critically cultural response. And I thought that um, in Jonah's podcast with Lyman, which um, we'll refer to as as the 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 Rachel Kleinfeld episode of inequality of the Jonah Remnant podcast, because our <laughs> vote by mail podcast was even better than Jonah's pandemic information podcast. But we don't we don't want to have inter dispatch rivalry. Um, there isn't one, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. But and then uh, so anyway, as Lyman was talking about when he was talking about Hong Kong, there's just an, there was a, a cultural response there due to information where people were masking, people were distancing. They were doing this on their own. And, and what I begin what I'm wondering is, as this goes on. If we're going to start to learn these kinds of social habits that have kicked in in countries like uh, in Taiwan or in a, a place like Hong Kong or a place like South Korea, where there is a a cultural response to the information about the virus that through things like universal masking, much more natural distancing, et cetera, um, allows us to to move out of uh, our homes on a more safe basis. The problem that I have and the question that I have is there are industries in this country that are really ill-suited to the social distancing world. Uh, the obvious professional sports, college sports, that's that's obvious. Uh, another thing is, you know, restaurants. I mean, these are high, uh, low margin businesses. Like they need all their tables. And when how are we going to have restaurants thrive if people are keeping their distance from each other? But I, I think it's going to end up with a lot of masking that is not something Americans are used to, especially in the big cities. It's going to be a lot of distancing that Americans have never been used to. Uh, but I think that we're going to end up perhaps with a culture in response to illness that looks more in the way Southeast Asia has reacted. You know, I, I did this um... – Remnant podcast with uh, James Pethokoukas, my colleague at AEI, and we were talking about this. That's actually great to know how to pronounce his last name, because I've been reading him for a while, and I just go P, and then I trail off. <laughs> it, uh, you, you also just call at, at AEI, we basically just call him Jimmy P, or hey you. But, <laughs> um, uh, you know, we were talking about this, you know, the the committee to save the economy, or to open the economy guy team and um it's uh and it inspired me to write this somewhat long weird piece for this, that's on the website today um about how we could stumble into a new new deal if this goes badly um you know regardless of whether or not Donald Trump has the authority or the ability which are two different things um to reopen the economy if he goes out and claims that he has, you know, which and he has this tendency to do sort of a headline on a press release as substitute for policy stuff, you know, where he just announces that he's done something and that's a substitute for actually doing it. Um, 
if he announces that he's reopening the economy, a lot of people will follow his lead. And if enough people do it and he's right and we've had a, we got this thing under control, it'll be great for him, right? I mean, he got America moving again. He'll take credit for it. And in politics, that's fair game. If he's wrong, if millions of people leave their homes and start getting together and going to NASCAR and Trump rallies and you get some super spreaders out there and we are in a worse shape in terms of the pandemic than we were before, he will get blamed for it and for the economic crash that will come with that in ways that you can't blame him for for this stuff right now. And, you know, you can't blame you – can, you can say he didn't do everything he could have and he did, hasn't been as good as he claims to be and all that kind of stuff, but he's not responsible for this pandemic. If he sends everybody back out there, like if he blows the whistle and everyone charges out of the trenches into the machine gun nest of, of COVID – and you have really bad consequences for it, then he owns it. And um, and that's one of the reasons why I think this the, the, the committee thing is so weird is he's got no, like normally what you would want to do is have as many stakeholders as possible on that commission so that both parties have buy-in, that you can spread the blame. You'll still get more than your fair share of credit. He's put his daughter and son-in-law and, you know, uh, what's his face, Wilbur Ross and Steve Mnuchin on there. It's basically the Trump's id commission. And um, and so if he gets this decision wrong, we're screwed. And he's screwed. And if that happens, you can see Biden winning or whoever the Democrat ends up being, because who knows, uh, winning in a massive landslide that uh, gives – the Democratic Party, all of the power they need to do what they've been trying to do for a century, which is have another new deal. And I think the stakes of this politically and economically of, of Trump getting something like this decision right, I'm not even sure it's dawned on the White House, the, the stakes involved. And just to have some uh, that was initial reporting on who would be on that council. Uh, that has changed somewhat. And the president. Oh, announced- has it? OK. Different people who would be on the council yesterday uh, during his Rose Garden uh, daily press. Jean Pirro. <laughs> uh, the names that he mentioned: Jamie Dimon, uh, Stephen Schwartzman, Tim Cook, Mark Zuckerberg. Oh, was that the point of that long list of names? Well, there were several long lists of names, Jonah. Because <laughs> I started, I, I really, I started to tune that thing out because I just, I, you know, I. I missed what it just sounded I, like a reading his phone log or something. I would say, as of the taping of this podcast, we do not yet know who is on this council. Uh, okay, it's probably so I, the most I, fair accurate enough. way to phrase that. Um, That's good. That's good. <laughs> uh, Steve, I do want to make sure we leave enough time to talk about some of the governor overreach that you mentioned a second ago, uh, because they fall into some different categories as well. So, on the one hand, uh, let's dive into Michigan for a second. Uh, according to the governor uh, who put out a new order uh, several days ago, can't travel to an in-state vacation residence, can't use a motorboat, and then businesses can't uh, have to close off areas, can't sell um, areas dedicated to carpeting, flooring, furniture, garden centers, plant nurseries, or paint, which has caused actually an enormous amount of confusion in that state where one Walmart uh, accidentally cordoned off infant car seats, which is a big deal if you're pregnant during coronavirus and you've got enough problems on your hands and now you don't I'm have not. a way to get your baby I'm home. not. I look like I am, <laughs> but I'm not. Uh, and this is uh, it comes with a, a criminal penalty. You can get charged with a misdemeanor, though unclear how much there's enforcement. So let's call that one type of overreach. But then there's sort of the political overreach, let's call it, in Kentucky and Mississippi about these drive up church services where you stay in your car for church. Uh, A judge in Kentucky overturned that right before Easter in Mississippi. The Department of Justice is getting involved uh, as well. And then, so let's call that the maybe left side. And then on the right side, we have the abortion debates for a variety of reasons that I will not bore listeners with. The Supreme Court did not have to rule on the Texas abortion case uh, and the, and Governor Abbott reissued his order, which will now be in effect for three more weeks, 
Uh, but this is true in states around the country where it, some could argue, <laughs> to borrow a phrase, that governors are using this for some pet projects as well. So how do we, I don't know, match small government conservatism and federalism with uh, overreach? Well, I, I think to a certain extent there, there are two different questions. One, I mean, I think, you know, as, as both David and Jonah have written, and we have a very good piece from Tim Sandifer uh, from the Goldwater Institute on the website today, the, the governors have uh, this power. I mean, they are, they are the ones who, whose power uh, accrues to them at this time much more than the federal government um, for reasons I leave to, to David and to, to the uh, people that have already explained this at, at some length. I think that the, the, you could see from the perspective of a governor that they would want to issue very tight restrictions with the understanding that people are going to violate these restrictions. And even if you have some people violate the very tight restrictions, the tighter the restrictions are, the more likely it is that they'll still have uh, a pretty significant effect on social distancing. The problem is... If you have absurd restrictions, which I think a lot of the uh, rules that you just laid out are, you can have the opposite effect. Then people just stop. People just stop paying attention to the restrictions that you're announcing because they're silly. They don't make any sense. They don't sort of pass the common sense test. And I think that's what's um, potentially the risk here. It reminds me, I mean, as I was reading these stories about um, Gretchen Whitmer and sort of the arbitrary closure of these things. And, you know, it's fine that they vary from state to state. But when you take a step back and you look at the big picture and you think Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida, has declared that uh, professional wrestling is essential and you have uh, rightfully so Gretchen <laughs> that, I guess you could make a federalism argument there <laughs> uh, and Gretchen Whitmer you know cordoning off garden supply centers you look and you think boy that just doesn't make any sense at all particularly given that there are outbreaks in both of those places but there is I mean the arbitrary nature of this I think is sort of a good warning about the growth of government in general obviously we're in this crisis moment and these are uh, you're talking about some extraordinary measures um, at this point but I, I remember uh, doing interviews with Dick Cheney for a book I wrote about him uh, 10 plus years ago and Cheney was basically the note taker um, or the typist on uh, President Nixon's wage and price controls. And he would talk about being in the room with Don Rumsfeld and some of these others uh, as they were trying to come up with these rules for to, to basically run the U.S. economy. And, you know, they were you know, sort of throwing darts at a dartboard to figure out what the price of ground beef would be and how you would restrict corn. Would sweet corn be restricted, but popcorn wouldn't be restricted? And there is sort of an arbitrariness to all of this that I think really risks eroding the, the sort of purpose of the rules in the first place, which is to get people to, to follow them and to flatten this curve. David, there was a protest in Raleigh uh, in which the police tweeted that protesting was not an essential activity. <laughs> uh, I think we're about to have a lot of conversations over the definition of police power. A Pennsylvania Supreme uh, Supreme Court opinion yesterday said that the use of the police power uh, cannot be a government taking, which just plug for advisory opinions. It is not a topic we will dive into here, but uh, that is the exact kind of topic we will dive into on advisory opinions, <laughs> my podcast with David French. Uh, uh, but overall, legally, how safe a ground are these guys on? Well, as a general rule, when you're talking about something that is going to be able to be rationally tied to stopping the known causes of the spread of a viral, pan you know, a viral disease, especially at this point where, as we talked about at the very beginning of the podcast, coronavirus is the number one cause of death in the entire United States on a daily basis at this moment. Your governors are going to be sort of at the apex of their power. But as we saw in the Kentucky case, apex of their power does not mean unlimited power. And so when 
uh, a Louisville mayor said you can't have a drive up church where no one gets out of their car. The cars are parked apart from each other. Um, but you can have a Lowe's parking lot open where people do get you know, stay in their cars and get out of their cars. Um, or you can have drive through liquor sales. Well, it was very hard. And, and you made a very good point, Sarah, in the podcast that we never got to hear Louisville's side of the story because this was uh, the motion was granted on an ex parte basis. But um, it's going to be really hard to make the case that uh, this is going to be rationally related or the least restrictive means under the strict scrutiny test. That should be precise. The least restrictive means under a strict scrutiny test to uh, support the compelling governmental interest. Similarly, with uh, if there's not the same kind of constitutional interest in the purchase of seeds, for example, but it is it is very hard to argue uh, that taking police tape and roping off part of Walmart, but not the other parts of Walmart, makes a giant ton of sense. And so there's a, an element here where the common sense test comes in for sort of public exposure, which can lead to public shaming of government officials and change in policy, and then other elements, especially when fundamental constitutional rights are involved, where simply put, you won't meet the strict scrutiny test as in the Louisville case. Um, But I think that, you know, let's go all the way back to the start of the podcast. So long as these assertions of power, and again, I keep qualifying this by saying at this time, are obviously rationally related to containing the spread of a highly contagious virus that's spread by person-to-person contact, close person-to-person contact, as long as you're you're tying these things together, there's going to be a wide degree of public acceptance of them. And that does not mean that that public patience is unlimited, and it doesn't mean that the power is unlimited. But it does mean that at this moment, governors have far more power than they've ever had in their entire political careers. Some of them will abuse that. One, it's just obvious that that will happen, but so far it's the exception. Uh, I'm going to actually defend the gardening ban, not okay. from a. Um, uh, <laughs> the point, if I told you that 80% of the people going to Walmart right now are trying to spend their time redoing their backyards and getting all of their perennials in, et cetera. And that was what was causing so much foot traffic in the store. And that if you told people they couldn't do gardening right now, they needed to wait. And so then you lower the number of people in Walmart to 20% who are the ones who need essential things, baby formula and toilet paper. Um, I think that that is reasonable. But do you think that's happening? I mean, do we think that there's a crush at Walmart because people can't get their hose? Well, I look on the if gardening side. Sorry, Jonah. I know that triggered <laughs> Jonah. Jonah wasn't even paying attention, and then he heard hose and he sat up. <laughs> the fourteen-year-old boy part of the podcast has begun. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm a bros before hose guy. So you know, I don't know what you're talking about. But you can't have uh, bros now either. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, I don't know. In my neighborhood, people are using this time to garden. I, I mean, I guess the part that undermines my argument is the carpeting and flooring. Maybe there's some run of people wanting to put in hardwood right now. That seemed a little less um, seasonal. <laughs> so can, can, I, can I add a, a, a possible additional defense? Even though, let me just say up front, I do think it's kind of ludicrous. If you want people to feel less like they're in yes. uh, prison give yeah. them the ability to do things like garden, right? Yes. But that said, it may also be, we now are seeing that, um, and since I didn't know about this updated committee to save the planet, uh, maybe I'm missing some fact here too, but um, it may also be a manpower issue, right? If we now know that a bunch of these big stores, they're having their own employees suffering from the vi- com- contracting the virus, and if you close off certain parts of the store, you need fewer employees to operate the store. Um, I don't know that that's the case, but I could see that being a a reasonable argument to make. You're you're very close to the argument that uh, the governor has cited in Michigan, which is that it is for the protection of employees because they can now have fewer employees in the store. 
uh, it, it keeps employees safer when you actually do have a number of grocery store and big box store employees getting sick because of the foot traffic, people asymptomatic coming into the store. See, I have a gift for channeling the logic <laughs> of authoritarian governors. <laughs> of, of Gretchen Whitmer. Look, but there are other ways around that too. I mean, we don't need to belabor the point, um, but there are other ways around that. I mean, you can restrict the entrance to 20 people at a time if you want to make sure that people are socially distanced and exposed store yes. employees to fewer people. I mean, there are just ways around that, that I, around, I think, silly restrictions like this that have the same effect on public health or, or have the potential to have the same effect on public health, but allow people to take seriously what they're hearing from their governors. I do think that when you have these kinds of restrictions or that, you know, I mean, the, the absurd case is the, the guy running by himself on the beach, this, this video that circulated on social media all week, and this cop trying to run down this lone runner on the beach and thankfully getting totally dusted by the, the runner. But people, people look at that and they say, you know, kind of to hell with it. If this is, if this is what the governor, governors are requiring, if this is what's against the law, then I'm not going to even follow the restrictions that I think are unnecessary to protect my own health. And I do think then you, then you have people starting to make decisions that, that probably aren't uh, in, in the broader interest of public health. Okay, let's switch topics in a, in a larger way. The president also yesterday said that uh, he was halting all funding to the World Health Organization while his administration conducts a review of the organization's uh, response to the coronavirus. What that means in reality is that the money that has not yet gone out the door for the 2020 funding for the WHO will not go until the review is conducted. Um, that's at least 50% of the funding, according to one administration official. And the United States as a whole accounts for about 15% of the WHO's budget. This has been, um, you know, boy, do people have opinions. So... <laughs> Uh, the United Nations Secretary General saying now is not the time. China, uh, not surprisingly, expressed, quote, deep concern. But perhaps to more surprising. So Bill Gates says halting WHO's funding uh, is as dangerous as it sounds. Their work is slowing the spread of COVID-19. And if that work is stopped, no other organization can replace them. The world needs the WHO now more than ever. Congressional Democrats are disputing the president's authority to do this, of course. Like, if they've authorized the money to go to the WHO, his authority to stop sending the money is uh, in question. Although I've certainly seen some write-ups that after the review, he would probably be on OK ground because of the authorization for this funding. Meanwhile, Republican lawmakers are planning their own investigation to examine the early response by the WHO and its ties to the Chinese government. Uh, a couple things here. I mean, generally, WHO funding, uh, Steve. But also, is this what is going to be the next great political divide in the United States? Sort of the China, not China discussion with WHO serving as sort of our first volley over the net. Yes, I think it, it is. Uh, and I think that explains part of what the Trump administration is doing here. They, they've obviously um, got an interest in blaming China for what we are seeing right now. And, and frankly, I think they're correct to do so. I mean, if you look at the way that China behaved, there was a new Associated Press story out today that China withheld information that it had about uh, the transmissibility of the disease and just what a big threat it posed to not only China, but the world at a time when the disease was spreading rapidly in China. I mean, it is totally appropriate to point fingers at China here. I also think it's appropriate to point fingers at the WHO. When you go back and you look at the, the kinds of things that the WHO was saying, at the kinds of things that the WHO was doing um, that offered support and praise for China at a time when it was being widely discussed in international media, uh, what China had done to distort its reporting, and the WHO is still getting China's back, still praising China, still going out of its way to avoid criticizing China. The WHO has a, a lot to, to answer for right now. So just because this, I think, plays to the president's advantage, 
um, doesn't mean that journalists and Democrats and Trump skeptical Republicans shouldn't uh, should avoid criticizing the, the or should be criticizing the president for it. I think the president is right on on substance. I think the big question on this is a matter of timing. Um, is it appropriate to take this action now to suspend this uh, these payments now? You had the CDC uh, director, Dr. Redfield, come out and say the CDC works hand in hand on a day to day basis with the WHO, and we need to continue to do this. You have public health specialists at Johns Hopkins, at Harvard, and elsewhere pulling out their hair at the prospect of losing the data, the important data that they say that the WHO still provides, even if Dr. Tedros is out there, the, the WHO head is out there um, shilling for China in some respects. Their argument is we're still getting good information uh, on a country by country basis and the sharing, the WHO serving as a, as a clearinghouse for the sharing of that information is absolutely crucial to the defeating of this pandemic. So I guess I would, my inclination would be to do this, to have this kind of review, uh, start it now, but continue the cooperation to the extent that you can while you're conducting the review. And I wouldn't probably withhold funding at this point. Jonah? Yeah, I mean, I, I basically agree with Steve that on the timing part of it, if you've got someone, uh, you know, not that I've, you know, to use this sort of movie, Hollywood war movie, you know, sort of metaphor, someone in a platoon can screw up, but when you're engaging with the enemy, that's not the time you do the court martial. Is you like you like get a gun and get on the you know, uh, get on the wall because th- we are all hands on deck right now, and I'm sure there's a lot of mixed metaphors in there. My, um, and so I think the fact that right now who the WHO is um, helping more than it's hurting. Uh, is a really important part of the equation. And if we're really talking about doing everything we can to fight this, better to say, by all means, Congress really doesn't have very much to do right now. They can start their investigation stuff. But I think cutting off the funding right now is not really a great idea. And also, I worry a little bit. I, I, I agree with Steve. I agree with a lot of the things the president has said and what a lot of the critics of uh, World Health Organization and of China have to say. Um, but I don't think that, I think the way that Trump has, has talked about this is it feels more like he is looking for some globalist analog of the deep state that he can blame for everything. And, you know, when he talks about how China, WHO could have gone in earlier and figured this out and stopped this and all the rest. No, it couldn't. WHO does not have like the ability to, uh, parachute in against the orders of uh, domestic government and and assert itself. It, it cannot claim police powers during a pandemic. And um, even even though I think WHO has a lot to answer for, it feels more to me like this is you know uh, being done for the express purposes of finding a convenient scapegoat um, when he's under a lot of pressure, and that is not necessarily the best way to be conducting the conversation either. David, I'm sure you have thoughts. (laughs) So few things get my inner cantankerous conservative cold warrior self uh, more like animated than the very old phenomenon of funding international organizations that kowtow to communists. (laughs) Um, I'm having all these flashbacks to like 1987 and uh, my glorious 18th year of life. Um, but the, the, look, I mean, I think there's very little question at this point that WHO was part of the problem early on. I also think from there's an overwhelming amount of evidence that there are, that it's doing good and helpful things right now. Um, and when I first heard Trump saying, I'm going to cut off funding now, I I admit my first response, my initial first blush was good, good. They get what they deserve. But as I thought about it overnight in true dispatch, non-hot take fashion, by the way. (laughs) um, Excellent. Very good. I I had a little bit different. um, 
I had a little bit different thought and that what really helped crystallize my different thought was reading um, a, a good piece in the Atlanta by Graham Wood, who noted that who would be most likely to immediately sort of step up and replace our funding? Well, if they're shrewd, guess who it's going to be? The People's Republic of China, because we're not talking about a whole huge pile of money here. Um, it's a it's a kind of check that an authoritarian regime can stroke instantaneously and actually perversely enough enhance its influence and authority. So this is a lot more complicated uh, than simply saying the WHO did something bad and now the WHO needs to be punished in the moment. I, I'm with Joan and Steve. We need to accurately state what the WHO did, good, bad, and ugly. When this is all over, take a comprehensive look at the way that they behaved as part of a 9-11 style commission, look at this whole thing from start to finish, and then act accordingly. And if that means saying to the WHO, uh, you're not getting as much from us unless you implement reforms A, B, C, D, and E, uh, we should absolutely do that. But yeah, I mean, I think there's an element here that's same song, different verse of funding international organizations that uh, pay excessive deference to authoritarian regimes, but in the middle of the firefight, to use Jonah's platoon analogy, is is this the right time? Mm, I'm not so sure. You know, and and just just to add real quickly onto that, I mean, I think it's it's important to separate the WHO as an institution with from the WHO leadership, current leadership. I mean, there's no question, I think, that Dr. Tedros the director general of the WHO has been overly generous in his assessments of China and China's transparency, its helpfulness, and the effects of what China has done. He had been out in public crediting China for transparency, for providing good information, for taking a hit for the world um, long after it was recognized that China was playing games with the numbers, not only games with the numbers, with, with the data that it was providing directly to the WHO, but with the data that it was releasing publicly. So you have in the person of Dr. Tedros, somebody who's out there shilling for China. I think that's a fair, it's a harsh assessment, but I think it's a fair assessment if you go back and you look at the comments that he made, particularly you know through, through late January and well into February. It's unclear to me that he speaks for the broader bureaucracy. And I think this is the point that some of the, the prominent epidemiologists here in the United States are making. You know, they have good working relationships with people at sort of the second or third tier level. And by the United States withholding funding or somehow severing those partnerships, we could be information poorer as a result. So it, it may be more appropriate to focus the investigation and the review on Dr. Tedros and his public statements more than the WHO as a broader body. Jonah, politically he heading into November, is this what the Trump campaign and the Republican Party can rally um, maybe Trump skeptical or Trump not enthusiastic voters around, which is sort of this common enemy of China as embodied by the WHO's leadership, as we'll borrow Steve's point. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I do think, and I've written this a couple of times now, I think mm -hmm. that on the intellectual right, um, China is going to be one of these galvanizing issues, sort of a geopolitical version of Brett Kavanaugh, that people can disagree on all sorts of things, but basically agree that China is a malign actor and that we need to rethink our relationship with them to one extent or another. And there'll be huge policy disputes about what that means. But I think pretty much everyone will agree with the basic assumption. I also think that most Republican voters, whether however they feel about Trump, will probably agree with it. The only reason I'm skeptical is about the way you phrase the question is that, look, if we, if we take a 25, 15 percent hit to GDP – if we take, if we see economic, you know, stag not stagnation, decline, the likes of which we have not seen since the Great Depression, compressed into a three or four month period, um, 
if we see a second uh, reignition of the pandemic in, in scary terms, I think the China stuff will still be resident and, and, and important and it'll have a long tail after the election. But my God, I, I think that stuff just dwarfs um, uh, anything else in terms of political considerations. People who are on bread lines are not going to be like, well, I'm still going to vote for the incumbent because, uh, man, do I hate that pencil pusher at the head of the World Health Organization. <laughs> yeah. David, I think that's right. Uh, David, on the flip side of that, though, you've got to have some message as a campaign. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, at, the, at the very least, taking on China and WHO, culpability here is ground, particularly when it comes to China. Um, I think when it's all said and done, WHO's relative culpability compared to the PRC is a rounding error. But when it comes to culpability, initial culpability, I mean, taking on China has uh, is grounded in truth. Uh, but the problem is, um, as if you look and you track the public statements that Trump made from when the pandemic first arose in China to the point where, you know, he gave his his now infamous address where he restated three different pol- uh, misstated three different policies while reading from a teleprompter. Um, if you take the look at the statements in between that time and let's say you compare them with Joe Biden, Biden was actually coming across for a lot a many at many moments more skeptical of China than Trump was. Now Trump did make the decision to do the partial shutdown, but the record is replete between that time and mid-March with really credulous takes about China. And so even that record, absolutely, China did terrible things. Um, but I'm, it is far from clear to me that Trump's record from late January to the middle of March is going to be better than Joe Biden's. And I think Biden has got an opportunity here to say, no, you don't get to do this. You don't get to act like the China hawk when I have... 15 public statements from you about G that I would never make and skeptic and, and, and multiple public statements from me about skepticism from China that you did not state. So uh, I think that the Democrats would make make a real mistake if they just take the attack on China and react in the predictable way that sort of the resistance reacts, which is tend to then go the opposite direction from Trump. I think their better political move is to call out Trump on the the BS from the end of January to the middle of March and to say that this is a new political pose. It is not what you were saying when it mattered the most. I think that is as good a place to wrap our substantive discussion as any. But earlier this week, Nancy Pelosi was on James Corden's late night show, obviously from her house. It was actually from her kitchen. Um, And they had a nice discussion in which Nancy Pelosi showed us her freezer drawer. Nancy Pelosi's freezer drawer is entirely made up of ice cream, the vast majority of which is chocolate ice cream. She says that this is what she is doing during the quarantine. Um, And, you know, she seemed genuinely joyful when talking about chocolate ice cream in a way that all of us should be so joyful in talking about anything. Uh, It made me think because there have been these great uh, stories that are being done about shortages around the country. At my own grocery store, ice cream is definitely a high demand item. Uh, this week, we got the last vanilla ice cream. It was very exciting. Uh, we st- we hoarded the chocolate ice cream weeks ago because that we can't do without. Uh, a half gallon of ice cream has climbed price wise nationally five over five percent. And I guess I was just curious for you guys. Um, what is your quarantine ice cream go-to routine, Steve? So I'm a party pooper in that I, I'm not really eating much ice cream these days. Um, oh, so you I, disgust I me. I don't. I mean, well, obviously, if you look at me, it's not because I'm in such great shape. But there are th- that's an aspiration <laughs> at this point. But the, the, best, the best ice cream to have at this time or really any time is not, in fact, ice cream. It's frozen custard. And the best oh, yeah. place the to get guy. frozen yeah. custard is Wisconsin, obviously. 
And the best flavor of frozen custard, if you can get your hands on it, is grasshopper frozen custard. Uh, mint ice cream with fudge and oh. Oreo cookies, which is, I mean, it's just hard to describe how good that is. We grew up eating grasshopper and basically any and every other flavor from Gillies, which is a very famous Milwaukee, old school Milwaukee uh, butter burger and frozen custard stand. So obviously David hasn't had frozen custard or he wouldn't have um, harumphed when I mentioned it. Um, but I will make it a point w when this is all over to bring frozen custard to the office for everybody. We'll have it shipped out in dry ice so that you can, can it just all not have be it and, and then not it grasshopper? change your mind. Please not grasshopper flavor. That sounded yeah, like gra grasshopper grasshopper flavor itself. sounds grotesque. To it's me. not actual <laughs> grasshoppers. No, that's grasshopper sounds like it would be better. I despise <laughs> mint ice cream, mint uh, mint and all except in a mint julep and mint chewing gum. I hate mint with a blinding passion. Well, there's black yeah, raspberry, so. there's chocolate malt with whoppers, there's Reese's peanut butter cup. I mean, there we can come up with any and everything, but uh grasshopper is my favorite. Jonah, what's your ice cream du jour? Well, um I I I I annoy uh, my wife and daughter quite a bit because we they are fans of a broad spectrum of ice creams, and I am a pretty passionate coffee ice cream guy, um, and which is why I basically try to keep it out of the house. Um, and um, we haven't been doing that much ice cream either because uh, both my wife and daughter like to bake. They like to bake independently. They like to bake together. And so there's been a steady slew of pies and banana breads and whatnots coming out. And sometimes we'll have a little vanilla ice cream with those because vanilla ice cream is the right ice cream to have with baked goods. Um, but I do want to warn, you know, I, I, I sometimes I will wax prolix with uh, esoteric sesquipedalianism in the G-file. And come up with strange and exotic words for people. Uh, and I do think that a word that, again, the Germans come up with words that we are not ingenious enough to come up with. And there is the word Kummerspeck, which literally translates as grief bacon. <laughs> and it refers to the excess weight gained from emotional odor overeating. <laughs> <laughs> so ice cream can be can lead to a state of kummerspeck. Uh so you got to be a little careful in these trying times. That is certainly going to be the name of the podcast, David. <laughs> okay. It, but it just has to be grief bacon. Yeah. <laughs> grief bacon flavored ice cream actually be fantastic. If Hagen dazs came out with like kummerspeck ice cream, that'd be awesome. <laughs> so first I have to fact check Steve real time. I have had Frozen custard, or as I like to refer to it, creamy frozen butter with uh, with uh, sugar sprinkled in, and it's not great. But so my ice cream. You haven't I actually had good frozen custard then. We've got uh, a Culver's. I, I love Culver's. It's my favorite fast food place, and they're all about the custard. So I'm Culver's I'm okay is with pretty good. One. Well, I, the last one I had was in the Milwaukee airport, so maybe it wasn't Milwaukee airport frozen custard. wasn't great. That's but, not bad, actually. It's not bad. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Um, the ice cream of choice briefly is mint chocolate chip, but like the other guys, I, I have not been having, uh, I'm very much ice cream at all. Um, this ninja like physique does not maintain itself <laughs> at my age. Uh, but I do have a, uh, chocolate chip cookie dough hack, which is Pillsbury break and bake. It's gotta be the break and bake where you break off the little square and not the, the tube of the cookie dough. Cause you'll just eat the tube. And you you end the day with a just one or maybe if you're you you've run a lot two of the break and bake uh, squares break them off have a couple of fingers of a good bourbon and uh, you know we restarted Ozark from episode one and that's that's a good way to end a quarantine day I think 
So uh, I don't know whether it's a gender divide or a pregnant, not pregnant divide on this podcast. Although after y'all have said that none of you are particularly Those might be related, if I could just say. (laughs) After the, yeah, after the senior hour at the grocery store, we need a pregnant lady hour that is just restricted to the ice cream aisle so that I can get in there for my ice cream before everyone else. Uh, My ice cream actually aligns perfectly with Nancy Pelosi's when I am truly indulging, which is her freezer was full of Jenny's darkest chocolate ice cream, which she said you can get delivered, which I did not know. So you can learn things even from late night TV, but it's available at Whole Foods. It's just obscenely priced. Um, So I only get it once in a blue moon, but it is the best chocolate ice cream out there. And then I get a carton of fresh raspberries and dump the whole thing into the ice cream until the raspberries get just a little bit frozen on the outside. So they're just a little bit crunchy in the ice cream. My husband thinks it looks disgusting because it's like a melty mush of raspberries and chocolate ice cream. And it is the best thing ever. (laughs) Well, and and since pregnant ladies are immune from Kummerspeck, uh, I say hats off to you. <laughs> My doctor disagrees, funny enough. I was like, oh, I had like uh, a cake yesterday. She's like, you had a whole cake? I was like, no, I didn't mean that. She's like, don't, just don't do that. <laughs> uh, with that, thank you listeners for joining. Subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're getting your podcast. Leave us a review, shoot us an email, anything you'd like, and join us at thedispatch.com as well. We have this and so much more happening on the website and in our newsletters. We'll see you next week.